Good afternoon, Ms. Ratif. A very good after afternoon to you, Deputy Chief Justice. Are you ready? I am. I trust your will. I will. Good. I see that you're a mom of one, a daughter of 22 years of age. I am indeed. Does that make us kindred spirits? <laughs> Sorry? Does that make us kindred spirits? Indeed it does. Then. Although mine are many more than yours. I understand. <laughs> you hold a BLC and LLB and an LLB degree. That's correct. Obtained from UK. the University of Pretoria. Mm -hmm. That's right in 1989 and 1991? Correct. Okay. From about 87 to 91 to be exact, uh -huh. Deputy Chief Justice. All right. You started your foray into the workspace in the Ministry of Justice as a judge's registrar. I did. How old were you then? Um, I must have been about all of 20. Yeah. Uh, it was a very small stint. I actually just helped out a young lady who was going on a studying sabbatical, and it was for a three-month stint at the Palace of Justice in Pretoria. Mm. How did you find that experience? Well, it was it was rather exhilarating, but uh, you know, it's when you're a law student, you don't really understand the intricacies of it all. Yeah. So one makes a number of faux pas, but uh, my judge was awfully gracious and awfully kind, mm. um, and it was a wonderful experience. But I think if I know what I know now. I may have very well got a great deal more out of it than I did at the time when I was that young. Yeah, that's usually the case. A lot of things are wasted on the youth. Absolutely. Yeah. You did your articles in 1992 to 1993 and then started as a professional assistant in 1994. Yes. And then you... You left that firm, you were with Rutledge Modise, then you went to Newton's. Yes. Uh, okay. Deputy Jeffs, what happened there was Rutledge's had a Pretoria office um, and I went to the Pretoria office. That Pretoria office then pulled away and became Newton. So it was really, in effect, one and the same firm. It just changed its oh, name. I see. Yes, that's really what happened. Uh -huh, uh -huh. All right. Then you decided to strike it off on your own? Yes, I did. Mm -hmm. And uh, you did that for 10 years? I did. Then you decided to join the bar? Yes. In 2007? Correct. Mm -hmm. To date? Correct. Have you regretted that choice at any stage, that not, decision? Not at not. all, Deputy Chief Justice. As if at that particular time in my life, in late 30s, one, a number of my colleagues asked me why, and we teased and said perhaps a midlife crisis. But in truth, <laughs> it was such a form of growth, and it was the right space at the right yeah. time. Yeah. You do a lot of interesting things. One of your passions is child welfare, I see, and you've worked with uh, organizations such as, uh, is it uh, Door of Hope? Door for Hope? Correct. And to Baby, Baby Save, yes. what's that one? Baby Savers SA. What do you do with those um, organizations? Yes. Uh, Deputy Chief Justice, my practice as an advocate concentrated not primarily but mostly on medicine um, and a great deal of that became fertility law yeah. and infertility law obviously what flows from that is children's and children's rights and at a st stage I started doing a number of work for Kells and it just so happened that the difficulty that we have with abandoned children became a topic of discussion. And I then formed a think, a think tank, so to speak, with Kells to try and see whether or not, if we look at our existing legislation, whether or not we have what we call safe haven laws with regards to abandoned children, but more specifically centering on what about these young ladies? Are they act, the, the criminalization thereof? Um, is it abandonment per se? And then on equality, on in terms of male-female equality, it became the test on if a woman gives up her baby and is found criminally charged for abandonment in terms of the Children's Act, what happens then to the young man who basically just then walks away? 
So it became quite an interesting think tank, and we've got quite a lovely group. And the Door of Hope is actually one of these homes that takes care of abandoned children. But the pertinent interest here is, is that they have what they call a baby saver, which appears to be a controversial issue. And a baby saver, I always say, it's, it's just a little bit like a Moses basket, really. It's a conduit where a lady who wants to be anonymous places her little one in a particular container at the doors of the, the door of hope. So it's, it's a drive for the recognition of a body called um, Baby Savers South Africa, mm -hmm. in a nutshell. Very commendable. You're an expert in the law of fertility. Yes. That's a very niche area of the law. Hmm? It, it, it is indeed, but it's an exciting part of the law. Yes. Um, it's, it's as if um, the law is trying very desperately to catch up with medicine, which yes. is fantastic to be part of, because yeah. you learn a great deal. One's mind turns all the time. Yeah. You haven't had an opportunity to write a judgment in, in, in the area of the law, though. Not yet. I'm, I'm hoping to cases. do so. That would be quite a privilege. Yeah, yeah. You, you mentioned a brief um, you received from Carls to consider advising on aspects involving a class action in which the concept of obstructive violence, and I've never heard of this concept, yes. obstructive violence as an infringement of a constitutional right is to be claimed. Yes. Can you tell us a bit more about that? That got my interest all picked. Yes, it got my interest too, but the pity is, is that although I was approached to be part of that think tank, and it's because I do a great deal of medical negligence work too, um, and gynecological, um, Unfortunately, when I was asked to look at the papers once and settle the papers once the class action um, had been finalised, um, I wasn't given the papers. So I was also waiting with the bit between my teeth, yeah. um, but was never released on it. Oh, oh well. Okay, I'm going to leave any questions on your acting stints in Gauteng and judgments you may have written to the judge president of the division, to whom I'll hand over now, J.P. Mlambu. Thank you, Deputy thank, Chief Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Chief Justice. Good afternoon, Advocate Retief. Good afternoon, J.P. Um, you've acted for 26 weeks in total in Gauteng. That's quite correct. Right. And uh, I see in those acting weeks, you've had four weeks in the opposed motion. That's where you would have accumulated reserve judgments. Yes. But I note that it doesn't appear like you reserved for longer than two, a month or two months at most in yes. all your judgments. Yes, JP. Um, it, uh, when I, actually, it was a wonderful exercise to do that flow chart because I never really thought about it. Yes. But when I looked at it critically, um, I saw that most of the opposed matters were extempore. Yes. Um, those that were written... Um, obviously, uh, I think two months is, is a fairly good, good, uh, fair reflection. Yeah. Um, you, you haven't done work in the agent court. I haven't. Um, I did But you may have got one or two pass-overs, uh, pass-ons. You, you didn't have that. I didn't have pass-overs, but if it gives you any comfort, JP, um, in the 15 years that I've been an advocate, I have practiced in the urgent court. Yes. I'm quite a fair with what I have to argue as counsel as a substantial redress, and I think I'd be quite comfortable with, with deciding whether or not that aspect has been, has been um, no. proven and dealt with. Uh, the other thing is that um, in the opposed motion court um, in 2019, when I had the taste of my first stint, it was, it was quite a triggering moment for me in the sense that I realised that 29 years of experience mm. that I had and life experience almost came from my big toe and out of my mouth, meaning that if one looks at the 2019, um, I was able to get to the nub of the matters rather quickly, which I think is quite important in urgent matters. Yeah. Thanks for that response. I think um, perhaps this is accounted by the number of weeks you've acted, which is more than the divisional uh, threshold anyway, even though it may be viewed as illegal. I see. But we do have a threshold. I see. Um, 
you, you, you've not been allocated special motions. I have not. As well as special civil trials. No. Right. Um, in your stints in the, in the appeal courts, yes. did you have any criminal appeals that you dealt with? Yes, there are a number of criminal appeals, and I think I did note them down. Yes. Yes. Okay. And there's one in the, I think I yeah. placed one in the bundle, JP. You are actually in the list that's gone to the president for the conferment of silk, am I correct? Yes. Yeah. You have not heard yet. I think there's a, there's a wait now this year, no, last year and the previous year. Correct. We've not heard anything from the president. We wait eagerly, yeah. JP. Now, your appearances, you're an advocate. You, you appear in the, in the High Court, that's a given. Have you had appearances in the SCA, in the Constitutional Court? Only in the SCA, um, yes. JP, but not in the Constitutional Court. Okay. Now, I know that the bar has found nothing to criticize you on. They're actually uh, writing good reports about you and the reports they get from people who've appeared before you yes. when you were sitting. Um, I, as JP, want this commission to recommend candidates who will hit the ground running. The, the leadership sitting in that table there has been complicit in denuding the counting division of its capable judges. So, <laughs> so I need to build that capacity mm. again. Because when, Understood. you know, Gauteng attracts all this big work. It's a very busy, busy division, JP. Yeah. Mm. So I'm saying this to you to say, you've acted, you've been in practice, you're a specialist in fertility law, you've been around. You consider yourself to be more than ready to become permanent. When I reflected to apply, that was a test that I had to consider. And it's a resounding yes, JP. If I look at being an attorney, if I look at being a counsel, if I look at being a lecturer, if I look at being an examiner yes. and a mediator, uh, the answer is yes. Over 30 years, I think I have a great deal to give the judiciary. I'm 54 years old, which means I've got a, I've got a good term left in me. Yeah. Um, I've got health, so, and I'm energetic. I think there's, uh, I am certainly ready. Yeah. You were nominated, but you didn't want to accept the nomination until you consulted widely. And one of those people who consulted was myself, remember? Yeah, correct. I was out of the country. You had to wait for just over a week before we spoke. And you wanted to know whether, as JP, having seen you work, I feel you, you should accept the nomination. And uh, the rest is history. You're sitting here. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, DCJ. You no further questions. Thank you, JP. MEC? All right. Governor. Any questions, colleagues? Commissioner Dubois. Hey. Uh, thank you very much, uh, DCJ. Good afternoon, Advocate. Good afternoon, Commissioner. Yes, I, I read your profile here and what is on the table. For me, it's quite clear that you embrace transformation yes. because here in you train admitted attorneys you train people around issues of BEE on, on how to file claims and and th this is very very good according to me but my question is in the three arms of government yes. which one is the least transformed in your view and 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 in that in the in that sense, what is it that can be done to fast track transformation so that all of them must be must be equal? The Before least, you even respond to least. that, let me tell you why I'm asking this. Yes, because it gives me time to reflect. <clears throat> and finish, yes, let, let let me tell you why I'm asking this. Mm. Just looking at what we're talking about all the time here, I get a sense that we're using old laws 
in the current dispensation. For example, the Criminal Procedures Act, it is of 1977. When the president sets up a commission of inquiry, whether it's on or what, he uses an act of 1947. Yes. When you institute a claim in terms of the state liability, you use an act of 1969. I can go on and on and on and tell you that. And in my respective view, uh -huh. I think that the least transformed uh, arm of government, it is the judiciary. What is your take on that? Well, if I reflect on it, um, and if I accept your answer, because I haven't had time to really give it some thought, but let, let's, let's run with your, with your answer. Perhaps I would agree with it. Sorry. Perhaps, thank you, JP. Perhaps I would agree with it only in so far as it appears that those that apply those laws perhaps have not understood the value of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and what's incumbent upon them to do. So in other words, it's not necessarily a case of transforming the bench as it is, but it's the transforming of application and mind. So in other words, it means that everything is here. Our entire toolbox the Constitution, here to my left, is here. But it's encouraging, demonstrating how this tool gets used not only for constitutional issues, common law, and customary issues. So, yes, I, ho I hope that does answer. No, it's okay. I just wanted to test you oh, I see. On, on, on that particular aspect. Just on a lighter note, uh, DCJ, Last year, I gave my daughter two books, law books. The one, I think, is written by Lawrence Baxter, and the other one by Marinas Weichers, and said, this you must go and read. Now, the other time she comes to me, she says, you know what? Rex has got a lot of money. Either he takes people to prison, or Rex is having a lot of suing people. I said, no, Rex means the state. In that sense, you must understand it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Commissioner. Any questions for this um, candidate from the virtual platform? Yes. Yes. Okay. Go ahead, uh, Commissioner Singh. No, thank you very much, uh, DCJ. Good afternoon to you, Advocate Ratif. Good afternoon, Commissioner. Uh, I'm the virtual platform, as you can see. Uh, I was very interested to read in, in when you presented yourself that uh, during your practice, which traversed general litigation, uh, medical malpractice litigation featured prominently. Yes. Now, now you have been involved in medical malpractice legislation and uh, litigation. Mm -hmm. And I want to ask you this question to get your wisdom. Now, of late, we know the, well, from my experience uh, in Parliament, I think one of the biggest contingent liabilities the government has on its financial, uh, yes. in its finance, is land claims, liability, and medical claims. Mm -hmm. And there have been a number of interesting cases regarding uh, claim for medical negligence. With, with recently a landmark judgment in, in the Eastern Cape, yes. uh, where the, the, the uh, court ordered that uh, they should not pay money to the victim, but rather, you know, uh, provide care for a young patient. So that's, that's something left on. But in other instances, we found even government commenting and they've got the SIU to investigate what they call fake medical negligence claims. And to that end, they want to introduce a bill to limit the amount of claims to about a million grand and then also have more settlement rather than taking 16 to 24 months to deal with these claims, which it does. And, you know, just to quote from one of the articles, the Eastern Cape Health Department says the ruling of the Eastern Cape will help shield the public from, quote, unquote, unscrupulous lawyers who, quote, unquote, cheat litigants. How can you help South Africa in this matter if you are appointed as a judge? Thank yes. you. It is an interesting question, but at the same time, it is a little bit vexing. And I say that it's vexing because I can understand that principle applying and that thought process applying when one re refers to claims of medical um, injury relating to road accident fund claims.
But when one is dealing with situations where people have been hurt factually, in other words, the inquiry here is actually somebody that's really been personal injury to body that has traumatized them and whatever the case may be, we won't go into that. That is factual, a factual consequence, so it cannot be fabricated. But the important part here, I think, on the fabrication, even sitting as a judge, is actually the computation of the quantum. So if we keep liability aside and we accept that there is liability, um, we are finding more often that the, the realm of experts um, giving lip service and providing reports that actually don't speak to the heart of the actual future medical treatment um, is on, let's say, the rise. What that does require if matters do go to trial is very proficient advocates who can cross-examine these experts who are supposedly at the expert at the top of the field. But more importantly, the balance simply is for the judiciary to understand, or not understand, they understand it, but to apply the principle that, yes, one is entitled as an exception here to ex accept expert evidence, but actually, if it's not reasonable to reject expert evidence, and that doesn't happen, and it could happen because of volumes, it could happen because there's been consensus with regards to amounts of claims that are made, I'm not entirely sure Commissioner, whether the bill, and I haven't seen it, so I can't comment, but I, I, I'm assuming it, it's, it's much like the Workers' Compensation Commissioner Bill. In other words, you know, I don't know if it's a no-fault liability. I'm not entirely sure whether that common law uh, principle is going to be, be not adhered to. But I, I, I'm assuming it's, you're talking to capping off claims. Is that right? All right. So w once you're capping a claim... Yes. Once you're capping a claim, the other thing that you're also doing is you're taking away the redress of somebody, and in certain circumstances, um, children who are, and adults who are mentally impaired, who can't care for themselves and can't work for a dime. So the moment that you cap that, depending on whether the common law claim still stands, that's a different issue. But if the common law claim falls away, you are really taking away the only chance that a person has at negative inter -essa, placing them in the position they would have been had that very incident, or we call it insult, happened. So it, it is an important investigation, but it, one must consider each side exceptionally careful. And I suppose the best way to do it is to put yourself in that position at the end of a knife and realising that you can't do what you do anymore and your claim, your claim is capped. It's a mouthful. But no, thank you. I, I think the Deputy Minister is taking careful note of what you are saying because I know there's a separation between the judiciary and, 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 and parliament and negative. But uh, I just hope that uh, your wisdom can prevail and you can somehow make comments to that bill, even if you are appointed, you know, uh, a, 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 or recommended for appointment as a judge, because this is certainly a matter that vexes, I think, mm -hmm. not only politicians, but the country as a whole. Yes. Uh, because even one court even went out to suggest that uh, it's, the, it's, it's the departments that are at fault and, and then the kind of a very poor care that they are offering our people in these hospitals. That's you know, largely the cause. So, you know, I think they, one has to balance this very, very carefully. Yes. Thank you. I don't Thank know if you have any comment on that. I think that you've hit the nub. In essence, the practitioners are the voice of a patient in as much as legal practitioners are the voice for the client. And sometimes that falls foul and people get really injured. Yes, and the only way that they can go back to where they thought they could be, which cannot be if you're injured personally, is by looking to the law. But thank you for your question, Commissioner. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Deputy Chief Justice. Thank you. Thank you, DCJ. Thank you, thank you DCJ. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Commissioner. Uh, may I just ask, the DCJ asked you about the portion of your application where you reflect that you were briefed to give an opinion on novel issues. I think that's how you put it? Yes. And what was referred to was obstetric violence. Yes. Uh, did you provide the opinion to CALS? No. 
All right. And what, what happened to the matter? Um, I'm actually not sure. The think team actually never came back to me. So what it was is they, I was briefed in another matter dealing with um, sexual discrimination in the workplace. And through that, they found out my expertise in medical negligence. And so we then started having our initial, um, shall we say, preliminary chat. I then received a brief to say that documents were becoming to you to settle um, the class action. I must just wait. It's, it's coming. And then a follow-up, it is coming. Um, but, but it didn't in the end. So uh, apart from these preliminary chats, absolutely nothing, you did absolutely nothing, nothing on the Nothing matter. concrete to, to add any particular value which I would have liked to. Because I'm just trying to understand, Mr. Tifa, why that would find its way into your CV if actually you literally did nothing on the matter. Well, I think the important part or the thrust of it is, Commissioner, is that it basically states that my expertise in a particular field, working for Kells, they considered that actually giving me the brief would add some value in that area. And I found that rather, I thought that was, was wonderful. In other words, it gave me credence in a particular area. Are you aware that there are a number of juniors working on that matter? I am. Uh, and did you consult with those juniors? No, we, we consulted on another matter on the safe haven, and that's how... Um, I know that they are on that particular matter as well. All right, then just the, the last thing that I need to touch on is, I mean, you deal with transformation under a number of headings. Um, I don't have time to deal with each one of them, even though I would have loved to, to go quite carefully through it. But let's deal with uh, transformation through the upliftment of women. Yes. Now, you say that the transformation happens in, at two levels. When you were at the sidebar, you employed candidate attorneys who are women. Am I correct? Correct. So when you come to the bar, that I, I have a question, uh, mm. because what you reflect here is that you set up what you call an informal woman warrior group. Yes. Before I put my question to you, I just want to lay the, the basis. Um, you've gone to great pains in your application and in your, your CV uh, to portray yourself as a specialist, both in relation to medical negligence, but specifically also in relation to fertility. Um, litigation. Am I correct? Yes. Um, and so you see yourself as having specialist skills in both areas. Well, I think it goes further than that, Commissioner. It's not only that I see myself, it's that when I applied for silk, and as you're well traversed with the application of silk, my body accepted and was I carved a particular niche in that particular area of law and I was recommended on that basis. So it goes further than just my own sort of, sh should we say, subjective um, approach. Uh, th that leads me to my question. Um, yes. How many black women have you worked with as juniors in your matters? Yes. So the way that, oh, let, me, let me go back. Um, I can amplify how I deal with my practice and with the ladies within my group. Presently, I'm in a group called Group 33, and the reason for the, the move, amongst other things, was simply that the idea behind Group 33 is that it utilizes a third. In other words, it's a third race, a third gender, and a third seniority. The beauty about the chamber is that it is rather small. Mr. Tipa, I'm sorry, I, I don't want to interrupt you. We've got limited time. Right. Well, let, so let's get to the thrust to, of it. Let's get to the thrust the question, of it. So, how many black women have you yes. used as juniors in your matters? That's, that's the question. Four. Four from, four from, from my, yes, four. Through, is that four fully on brief with you? Yes. Um, and that's throughout your career? Yes. Right. And the four have been involved in medical negligence matters? Medical negligence and fertility and donation, Yes. In, in all of the three areas? Yes. And in terms of where I couldn't, or in terms of uh, cash or whatever the case may be, it, um, the attorney couldn't carry a junior, I create spaces. And that's why the preamble of the Group 33 was so important when I answered the question. Because the spaces are that where I can't give them the work, I then hand work over, particularly to tax, to other colleagues, 
I pull in on commercial matters where I have the ladies that work within my group. We have a very close-knit senior, junior, um, conduent practice together. And the woman warrior was actually to pull that all together to try and expand where they wanted to be because most of them don't necessarily want to be um, with medical negligence. In fact, most of them don't. And, and just last question, apart from the four black juniors, how many other juniors have you worked with? Two. So six juniors well, in total. Yes, yeah, so, so two, two other juniors, um, one being a black male and, and uh, one a white female. Thank you. Thank yes. you, Chief Justice. Commissioner Balloy. Thank you, Chief Justice. Good afternoon, Ms. Retief. Good afternoon, Commissioner. Yes. Um, Ms. Retief, it's, a, it's, a, it's really a follow-up. It's become a follow-up on, on a discussion with Commissioner Pillay. Yes. You, you say in your application that... Uh, maybe let me ask the question first. Yes. Um, are you appointed to CARLS? Yes. Appointed, what does it mean? You, you employed at CARLS? Yes, and what they did was they appointed me as an advocate for a period of time, and I think my uh, duration was two years. So from time to time, they would appoint me as a preferred advocate on a particular matter, and I have a letter of appointment for two years. Okay. Yes. So you're appointed uh, to, be, to be briefed on matters. You're Correct. effectively on their panel for two years. Correct. That's effectively what it means. Co Correct. Okay. So what does it mean where you say, at page 44 of your application, you say, I think the heading you have there is transformation through upliftment uh, transformation through civil society organization and you 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 speak about cars and yet in your explanation all it is is that your involvement with cars all it is is that you're on the panel to be briefed what, what does one make of that and and maybe let, let, me, let, let me let me level up with you that um, I'm uncomfortable because on the face of it it seems like you represent something that is not in, in, in that paragraph, and that takes me back to the obstetrics violence mm -hmm. issue as well. That was my concern there, that uh, if you answered that you, don't, you were waiting for the matter to come to you, you don't know what it is, then why is it there? And it's not telling us anything other than to create an impression, yes. uh, an impression that is not. Yeah. Commissioner, the, re the reverse is actually true. So with regards to the appointment of Kells, it started with a labour matter. And or actually before that, it started with me being introduced to Kells, giving a pro bono mediation course. I then received a brief to do a labour matter relating to sexual harassment. Seeing what Kells does and seeing what they do, I realised that on a number of my matters, and particularly the safe haven, which in fact is not originally a Kells matter, it's a matter which I took to Kells. In other words, I said, look, do you have the appetite um, to deal with this particular matter? And together with another large firm in Johannesburg, we've created this think team to forge ahead to do what we think is right together with um, Dr. Rosenberg on this matter. So it, it, it's... it's it, that's it in a nutshell. There's no, there's no misre misrepresentations at all. All right. Thank you, Ms. Retief. Thank, Thank you, Decision. You. Thank you, Commissioner Baloy. Any further questions for this candidate, colleagues? Y yes. Uh, oh, yes. DCJ. Prof, uh, go ahead, please. No, no. Thank you very much. Um, uh, good afternoon, Advocate. Good afternoon, Commissioner. Thank you very much. Um, a point has been made that the division to which you are going to be appointed um, receives all these big matters. Um, and in most instances, some of them are review matters, um, be it against the state generally or some other institutions. Yes. I'm not really sure the extent to which you have had exposure to admit law, but I just want to ask you a general question. Yes. Um, in relation to admin law generally. Yes. Thank you. That for, yes. Sorry, one, of the most, mm? one of the most crucial decisions that a legal practitioner will have to make when instituting a judicial review um, will be to decide whether to rely on PAJA directly yes. or to 
bring an application in terms of the constitutional principle of legality. Um, I just want to, to get your understanding as to the circumstances under which one uh, can bring an application uh, under PAJA, and if PAJA is not applicable, then under the principle of legality. Yes. Um, Commissioner, it, it's, it was a lengthy question, but I just want to understand. The, the first part of the question, as I understand it, is, uh, if I'm correct, is if I've had experience with reviews. Was that the first one? Yes, basically, yes. Yes, basically. And the second one then was amplified to ask whether or not um, one understands the difference between a review in terms of PAJA or a review in terms of legality, where, yes. for example, the, the state reviewing its own decision. Um, with regards to the first one, in my practice as, as an advocate, I also did petroleum work, um, meaning that I dealt with a number of matters on the other site or retail license, the acceptance or rejection thereof that went through a process, an appeal process. Once that internal process was exhausted, the only re remedy there was review. So on that basis in the law of petroleum, I um, dabbled in reviews. As far as being a acting judge, um, if one has a look at my stats, there's a number of matters uh, which are PAJA reviews and one in particular, a legality re review relating to the public protector. That particular judgment I have placed um, in the portion of my, my judgments. Um, coming back to the last question, um, the PAJA review, um, I suppose it's easier for me to state that if there's an administrative action by an organ of state or a natural person or a juristic person that is acting as a public body and has a public interest and there's a decision that affects somebody's rights, then one is entitled to go in terms of PAJA. In fact, the entitlement is actually you must. It's, it's, it's prerequisite. But in a set of facts where one finds that the, the very decision is a body who is the state, then one sits with a situation where the review must be brought in terms of the law of legality. So in other words, if the door is closed in terms of the statute being PAJA, then one then looks to a legality review. If that answers your question? Um, no, no, that, that is your answer, and I will, I will, I will live with. Uh, thank you very much, DCG. No further questions then, colleagues? I guess we'll be relieved to hear that the interview has come to an end, Ms. Riti. Thank you. Unless you still want to have a go at it. If this is the end of the road today, then I'm grateful and right. I'm very, very thankful. Yeah. Um, Thanks the, to you for, for making yourself available. Thank you very much. Yeah. You're excused. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioners. Thank you.